we are ready to start. On the program today is the Mac layer. Tomorrow we'll meet again for the test and for the next lab. We have seen that the Mac layer has been invented originally for shared medium and many of the existing protocols derive from one specific that is called ALOA. This is where we stopped last week. ALOA is, was developed for the Hawaiian islands. So imagine the island in the, the box in the middle is on one island and uh, where there is a central computer and there are four remote computers on four different islands that communicate by radio. That was in the 70s. There is one channel downstream and one channel upstream. Sorry, upstream and downstream that are on different frequencies so they don't interfere. You can send one message on one channel or on the other. There is no collision. There is also no problem when the center sends with the downstream link to the periphery because there is only one sender, so there is no contention, no collision. However, for the upstream link, there is collision. So that's the standard problem of the upstream link that remains today in cellular networks. And uh, so the ALOA protocol is for solving the collision of the upstream link. So assume we have one or several remotes that want to send data to the center. It is possible that at the same time there is another remote that also sends data, in which case there would be a collision. The ALOA protocol is the simplest you can think of, because what do you do? You simply try a number of times to send the packet you have to send, wait for an acknowledgement, the acknowledgement comes on the return channel, and if the acknowledgement comes, then there was no collision, or at least there was no destructive collision. The packet has been well received, so it's end of the story. Otherwise, if the act doesn't come after a timeout, this is taken as a symptom that there was a loss. Now, the loss might be for various reasons. It may be due to a transmission uh, error in the, on the uplink, uh, but here it is assumed that it's due to a collision, in which case you will try again. Of course, you don't try again immediately, why? Why don't you want to try again immediately? Yes? Because if you try to try to because if two the same time and so we both have to return it and we try it continuously, they're going to collide again. Exactly. So if there is a collision due to another remote sending at the same time, if you retry immediately, perhaps the same thing has happened here. If both retry immediately, then there will be a synchronization of the two uh, collisions and it will be a deadlock. It will repeat forever. Yes? When you say that there is a one shared channel between the remote and the center, yes. it means that when there is a collision, it happens at the center because the center yes. Yes, it happens at the center. Exactly. So this simple protocol is not trying to avoid collision. It's, a, it's an optimistic protocol. It sends packets. If there is a collision, you try again. And the only smart thing it does is to wait a random time that has to be chosen such that the probability of repeated collisions will uh, be small. We'll talk a bit more about that later. That's the ALOA protocol. Uh, the performance of the ALOA protocol is not extremely good. It can be shown that with optimistic assumptions, you can reach only up to 18% of the channel utilization, the max utilization that makes the system work. If you are above this, uh, then there are repeated collisions. The system goes into congestion collapse. It doesn't work. Simply. But uh, it's a very simple protocol that is used in particular because it is completely stateless. You need no synchronization between the different senders. So that's a protocol that is often the root of many other uh, building block used in many other protocols. For example, in CSMA, which is the basis of old style Ethernet and of Wi-Fi, we do the same thing except here we add an an, an additional item, which you see here, just this line is different. We listen for, uh, on the channel. So before sending, 
we listen to hear if someone else is already sending. This is not really applicable to the Hawaii Islands because that requires that you can hear everything that is said on the channel. People say if we have a transitive channel, so any device can hear whenever another device sends, which might not be true if you're sending to a base station and someone else is sending to the base station, but that someone else is very far from you. It's two times the distance from you to the base station, so perhaps the signal received from the other uh, is not perceivable by you, in which case this protocol will not work. But that's the one that's at the basis of Ethernet. On Ethernet, the system is designed in such a way that the cable is not too, too long. The original Ethernet had a cable length limit of one kilometer, such that if any system sends, anybody can hear. So if you can hear, then you can avoid collisions by not sending when someone else is already transmitting. That's what you do in this room or in another room. If you're polite and you talk before talking, you hear whether someone else is talking. Uh, to avoid collisions. So that has a that simple thing as a name, it's called Carrier Sense Multiple Access. And of course, it brings an improvement on the utilization that Aloha has. How far is this improvement? How good is this improvement? Can collision be avoided uh, with this principle? That's a question to you now. I close the poll in five seconds. You should see the results now. You should see that the majority says C, which is the correct answer. Uh, regardless of the parameters of the system, you cannot avoid collisions. Why can't you? Well, this is because the propagation of information is never instantaneously. A minute ago, we said, well, it can be that two systems are transmitting at the same time and there's a collision, but there's no way to know exactly what it means at the same time in the distributed system. And, uh, whoops, so this is what is illustrated now. This is showing a space-time diagram. So I have A and B that are both transmitting. Uh, space is horizontal and time is vertical. And the shaded area shows the signal that's propagating. When A transmits a signal, well, it's possible that B senses that the channel is idle, but it is not really idle. The signal is on the flight. And by the time B, uh, the signal arrives, it's too late, B has started a transmission. So that will always be unavoidable. To avoid this, you would need an out-of-band mechanism to synchronize A and B, but this would uh, not be possible with zero delay. So this problem can always occur. Now, the regions in space and time where the two signals overlap might cause a collision. So, for example, here we see that if B is sending to A, there will be a collision between the signal sent by A and the signal received by B. If both are sending to a node in the middle, then the node in the middle will see a large collision. So CSMA avoids some collisions. It avoids the collisions that it, if B starts listening at T equal 2, then there will be no collision. But there is always a dead period during which, which is equal to the propagation time, there's a dead period during which uh, you cannot avoid collisions. And that's true of any system, right? If you want to avoid collisions entirely, you will need some kind of polling or a mechanism to synchronize the nodes, for example. But if you do random access, if you want to be able to transmit at any time, you will not be able to avoid the collisions. Ethernet is based nonetheless on this, which is CSMA, by the assumption that the probability that this occurs is not very large, and with an improvement, which is called co collision detection. Yes, question? No, no, I didn't mean that. I mean, at t equal to b will hear that the channel is busy and will not start sending with CSMA. So this is Ethernet. In the Ethernet protocol, or let's say old-style Ethernet protocol, does exactly this with a little thing which is called collision detection, where instead of 
detecting a collision by receiving an, an acknowledgement, because we assume here the medium is transitive, you can hear on the medium whether there is a collision. So what uh, this says is, like before, you wait, you listen and wait until the channel becomes free, send a frame, and then you listen. While sending, you listen. If you hear a collision, a collision is typically heard because the received signal is higher than the noise plus the signal that you are transmitting. Then you stop transmitting, you send jamming. Send jamming is simply means that you continue transmitting for a short amount of time to make sure that the collision is reliably detected by all other systems. And then you will Re you will wait for a random time. Now, this random time is given here exponential, is given here explicitly. It is equal to the slot time, which is an upper bound on the propagation time, uh, the round trip propagation time, multiplied by a number between, which is between zero and one at the first attempt. That means if that's your uh, first attempt, k equal one. Uh, you will retransmit immediately or wait for one slot time. Then if you fail again, you will wait randomly between zero and three uh, slot times. And if you fail again, you will wait again between zero and seven, etc. So in average, the waiting time is two to the power k minus one. So in average, it increases exponentially with the number of attempts. So the idea is that if there is a severe collision, you defer more and more. That's a mechanism that we will see in TCP also for congestion avoidance. And so this is what is, uh, is done here. And that's pretty much it. So let's see on a simulation how it could work. So A is starting to transmit at time zero. And let's assume that there is a collision like before because B has started transmitting in the dead period where it's impossible to detect the transmission of A. Now A senses the channel and at this time here will detect the collision because it receives a signal while it is transmitting. So A will stop transmitting or more precisely will enforce the collision by transmitting, continuing to transmit for a short amount of time. It's so if A knows there's a collision, it will transmit dummy bits. There's no point in transmitting anything useful. B will do the same. B has also sensed the collision. So both systems now stop. They have both sensed that there is a collision. This is more efficient than waiting for an ACK because uh, the ACK uh, will itself need to be transmitted and uh, might be uh, subject to collisions here. What will happen next depends on what is the uh, timeout, the waiting time that is drawn by A and B. Here, B draws a smaller value than A. Then what will happen is when this uh, fires, B will start transmitting. A will wait also for another time, but now at this time, when A, sorry, when A wakes up here at this time, so during all this interval, A does nothing. At this time, A senses that the channel is busy and will wait until the transmission of B is finished. That is CSMA CD, and that is the basis of practically all the shared medium access protocols that are based on random access. Um, a few peculiarities of this form of, of uh, CSMA, called CSMA CD, is that you need a minimum frame size to reliably detect the collision. Here, here is an example showing two cases where the packet size sent by A here is short compared to the round trip propagation time. And then if that happens, it is quite possible that A is finished transmitting before B starts sends, before A senses a packet sent by B, but this packet sent by B has caused a collision somewhere. Here it has caused a collision at point C, which is perhaps the destination. So if that happens, uh, there is a collision that is not sensed by A. How is this avoided by the Ethernet standard? Simply by requiring that a transmission is always long enough for this to be impossible. So you have to transmit an amount of bit that is at least as large as the bandwidth delay product. In Ethernet, this is 64 bytes, 512 bits. That's the minimum size of any Ethernet frame due to this uh, weird thing here. Of 
course, since in Ethernet the packet size is fixed, that means that the bandwidth delay product uh, is fixed, and therefore the size of an Ethernet shared medium network should decrease with the link rate. So that's old style Ethernet. I said one kilometer is two, at 10 megabit per, uh, per second. That's cheap Ethernet of today, where if you use shared medium access, the maximum cable length should be 200 meters because of uh, this limitation of the protocol. And this is what is called, what I call old style Ethernet. That's the Ethernet you would find 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, when you cable systems uh, f by physically connected to a share cable. Well, for example, this is a coax TV style uh, cable where you can physically connect here by uh, simply doing mechanical connection with no intelligence, no electronic. And this is also called half duplex Ethernet. Why half duplex? What does that mean, half duplex? Yes? Exactly. Half duplex mean, duplex means you can transmit on both directions of the channel, which is the case for all channels today. But half duplex means you cannot transmit at the same time. So here, if A sends a packet, then B cannot transmit at the same time because that's a shared medium. That's the rule of shared medium. So half duplex in this setting means shared medium. It's synonym here. So this is uh, fairly exotic. Uh, you might still find it if you really need, for example, to have a two kilometer long cable with Ethernet, then you can use this kind of systems. Uh, but today, this, uh, as we will see, Ethernet uses different technologies. But this is quite visible in wireless technologies. Uh, wireless Wi-Fi is the most famous one. Uh, all the cellular networks use variants of this also, with also some more synchronization and uh, other half-wireless, half-wild technologies like power line communication also use similar things. Uh, so the Wi-Fi, so here this is a Wi-Fi access point and the host A sends to B, then it uses also CSMA in pretty much the same way with one uh, additional thing, which is that it is not necessarily true that the medium is transitive. More precisely, if A sends a packet to B, and if C sends a packet to B, that might cause a collision at B. But it's not obvious that C will hear that A is sending, depending on the uh, geographical location. If C is very close to A, C will hear it. But if C is opposite of A, like here, C might not receive the signal from A or might not be able to distinguish it from noise. So this is solved partly. It is not entirely solved, but it's partly solved in Wi-Fi by having an exchange of short packets which are ready to send. This is a typo that uh, I copy-pasted from the textbook that I recommend. It's RTS, not RST, ready to send. So when A has a packet to send to B, A will send a short packet uh, using CSMA. Uh, that means I am ready to send. And what B will do is it will acknowledge by sending a clear to send, but this acknowledge will be sent all around B. So C will see this acknowledgement. So this serves as an approximation to when A wants to transmit something, C will see it. Because when C sees a clear to send message, C remains silent for a long period of time because it can infer that some uh, packets will be transmitted. The thing that Wi-Fi adds compared to Ethernet is also the fact that every packet is acknowledged uh, like in Aloha. There are many more details of the standard of Wi-Fi is, th is more than or close to 3,000 pages. Uh, every frequency might, uh, every fr frequency band might add a few bells and whistles, but essentially uh, that's what we will remember from it. In a Wi-Fi network with a single channel and a single base station, how many frames can be transmitted in parallel? I close in five seconds. Ooh. And the correct answer is, is A, at least today. Um, so Wi-Fi is a 
half duplex technology. It's useful to think about it in this way for us when we will talk about bridged lands, so we can think as a LAN being made of collision domains, so domains in which we can send only one packet at a time that are separated by bridges. In this setting, Wi-Fi is one collision domain. So that's the theory of shared medium access, and the MAC layer is called medium access control layer due to this. But in reality today, the MAC layer, at least in wired network, is really more like a, network, a true networking layer. It's made of switches. So Ethernet LANs today are very rarely in this form. Normally, how they are is you have a switch, which is called a switch, which is also called a bridge. So a bridge is a system that forwards packets based on their MAC addresses. So it's another way to do the MAC layer. Instead of doing it shared medium, then you do a packet switch in the middle, which makes sense because we want to do packet switching in the Ethernet, in the, in the Internet. So it's a queuing system. For example, if A sends a packet, then a very simple switch would have an input queue and a number of output queue, output queues, so it, everything it receives is stored in a buffer, then the, pro it, the processor goes, for example, in round-robin fashion, looks at all the in input buffers, see if there is a packet, analyzes the destination address, and based on its forwarding table, will put it on the correct output. Right. This is uh, what happens in a switch today. Now, a peculiarity also is that if you have a switch, there is nothing shared in terms of medium. There is the wire between A and the switch are not shared by C, for example. There is a different cable to connect A to, through the switch with that type of uh, jack type connectors, uh, which is not at all shared by C. So there is no reason for sharing. Since there's no reason for sharing, there's no reason to have a protocol, except if you are half duplex. But of course, there's also no reason to be half duplex. So normally, an Ethernet cable today has two pairs. On one pair, you can transmit one signal. If you have two pairs, you can transmit two signals. And you can transmit one signal in every direction. So the switches came historically after Ethernet was developed as a way to improve the performance, but today they are uh, by default what you do. And since between A and the switch there is one pair of wires to transmit packets in one direction and another pair to transmit in the other direction, there is no contention, there is no CSMA CD. So full duplex is the way that is uh, the term that is used here, and full duplex Ethernet means no Ethernet, or at least no CSMA CD protocol. There is a packet format that is called Ethernet, but it's only a format. It is a point-to-point -point link. Of course, now the, the, the main part of this is the switching system, the bridge. So a bridge must queue things, like any packet forwarding uh, device, as we have seen, in addition, it must forward the packets, the frames. In order to forward the packet, it does these things. First, it listens to all traffic on each of its ports. So sometimes we say that the bridge is promiscuous. This is what you do when you use uh, a, a packet sniffer. You listen to all traffic, not necessarily yours. So a switch does the same. All packets that comes on all ports is copied to the input buffer. Then you inspect the packet to find what is the destination MAC address. And by default, what I'm describing here is the default switch operation. We will talk a bit later and see that by software-defined networking, you can modify all the operations of a switch. But by default, what you do is you go to a forwarding table, which is different from what you do for IP. It's a table for where you do exact match. So in the forwarding table, you have a list of all the MAC addresses and the interfaces. For bridges, we sometimes say interface, sometimes we say port, it is the same. The interface on which this address is, for example, here B is on interface number two, C on interface number three. So if the bridge receives a packet from A with MAC address destination B, it will send it on the interface number two. Right. 
if the destination address is the same as the origin, uh, or as the interface uh, on which you receive it, you discard the frame. Right? This might be a bug, but this might happen if the bridge is interconnecting. A bridge can be used for point-to-point -point links, but can also be used to connect shared medium links. For example, this might be an entire Wi-Fi network. So in, in such a case, it is possible that on a Wi-Fi network, A sends a packet to another A, A prime that is on the same interface. And uh, if the bridge knows that A prime is in interface number one, and it has received the packet on interface number one, then it does nothing. It doesn't send it. So it makes the assumption that the collision domains on each of the interfaces are able to, trans to transport the information without the help of the bridge. How do the bridges build their forwarding tables? By default, a bridge, or let's say a, a standard bridge, is what we call a learning bridge. So it constructs the table by learning. More sophisticated bridges might use a method that is very much the same as a routing protocol. It's not called routing because it's for bridges, but it is exactly the same thing. We'll see that a bit later at the end of the link state module. It's called shortest path bridging. But the default bridges, the, buys, the ones you buy at Migro, don't implement shortest path bridging. They just implement this, where the bridges at the beginning do nothing. When they come, they're empty. If A sends a packet to the bridge with destination B, and B doesn't know what to do, it will forward it to all interfaces. It will flood it. Right. So hopefully, if A sends packets, sooner or later, somebody talks to A. Practically all protocols are like this. There are applications that are strictly one way, but they are extremely rare. If that happens, the bridging learning method will not work. So sooner or later, somebody will talk to A, and there will be, for example, a packet coming from B here on this interface. And what the bridge does is look at the source MAC addresses. So when A has sent a packet, the bridge has learned that A is on interface number one. When somebody talks to A, then that somebody uh, gives to the bridge the information on which interface it is. So it's a bit like... Uh, Sorry, so those values are put in the forwarding table, and like an ARP table, the forwarding table is treated as a cache if uh, those tables have a timeout and, and those values have a timeout and they will expire after some time. For example, to handle the case where you physically move B from interface 2 to interface 4, for example. Yeah. Right. So if you do that very frequently, you will have problem. If you disconnect from a switch and connect to another port, it will take some time for the switch to unlearn what it has learned before. Right. So this is how it does. It learns uh, all the addresses. Now that's for a single switch. Now of course, we would like to build a network of switches. So here is an example. I have a network of three switches. I call them bridges. Bridges and switches in this context here mean exactly the same thing. Will this work? So if everybody learns what they see, so that means now if A sends a packet to E, the packet might be flooded everywhere, it might arrive at B3, B3 will have the impression that A comes from port 1, which is not physically strictly true, but seen from B3, that is what happens. So if all the bridges do this, will it work? I close in five seconds. The majority says A, but as we know from last week, the majority is not always right. Uh, this will work here on this specific topology, but it will not work there. If there are loops in the topology, then you will not know. I mean, if, you, if B1, when it doesn't know what to do, it floods it, then a packet to E from A might arrive on port 3 or on port 1, depending on the randomness of the queuing and the propagation time. So B3 doesn't know really whether it comes from A or from this or from that side. It might oscillate, and if you have a very complex network, so it will be a nightmare that the things will oscillate and will not converge to anything useful. 
So we have a problem if there is a loop. Now, is it reasonable to assume that there are loops in a topology? Uh, probably yes. I mean, this is a very simple ring of three switches. Why do we want to do loops in a topology? Yes? To have alternate paths, so it's for reliability. If, if we have a network like this one, if you break anything here, the network is disconnected. Perhaps it's not important if it's a network that is not critical, but if the network is critical, if this is the backbone, for example, of a city, you want to have some reliability by having redundant paths. And a redundant path automatically means loops. By the way, a very frequent topology is rings because that's a simple topology that you can easily analyze and that always has uh, one redundancy. So that will not work. So this learning method doesn't work. How is that problem solved? By default, the learning bridges implement what is called the spanning tree protocol. So it's a very brutal method that consists in saying Loops cause problems, let us remove the loops. So what the spanning tree does, it, which it's a protocol that's run in all the switches, they talk to each other, and they talk in such a way that they will decide to discover the loops and break them. So for example, in this topology, those three ports would be disabled here. And this is done by the spanning tree protocol. Of course, you might say, why do you want to have loops, then break the loops? There is still a benefit. This protocol is, of course, adaptive. It's a soft state protocol, so the bridges continuously monitor what is happening. If a link is broken, for example, if uh, this link, LAN C, is broken, then we've lost connectivity between switch 7 and switch 1. Uh, but the bridges, those ports, are not physically disabled. They are closed for traffic, but they continue to be monitored. So the bridges continue to talk to each other over all the ports, so they know all the available uh, links. And if there is a change in the topology, they will recompute another uh, active tree. For example, if this link breaks, they will compute another tree such that, the, if it's possible, such that uh, the topology is still connected. So it is a way to, it's a primitive way, but still it keeps the automatic resilience to faults. If you have a ring, for example, you will break the ring somewhere, but if the link, if one of the link gets broken, you will undo the breaking that you did before. More specifically, how is this done? The spanning tree protocol is in fact summarized here in this poem. It's called an algo rhyme. Uh, it's authored by Radia Perlman, who is the author of this poem and of the protocol that is implemented in the bridges. She's called sometimes the mother of the internet. She's less famous because women are usually less vocal than men, but she's also one of the key uh, historic players on the internet. And not only she did this wonderful spanning tree protocol, but she also explains it in a very short way. So if we could stop here. It explains exactly what we do. So I will build a tree whose crucial property is loop-free connectivity. This is just to make the rhymes work. Um, a tree that is sure to span, so it must reach all bridges. In fact, all lands that are connected to all bridges. And here is how it works. First, the route must be selected by ID it is elected. So the bridges select a route, which is the one that has the smallest number. You can also force a topology to choose a given route by adding a priority field such that the number is, the, is, is under your control. And then all bridges compute shortest path, least cost path, from the route to themselves. And this is what constitutes uh, the shortest, uh, the tree. We'll see uh, a few more details. So this is essentially repeating what I said. Um, now, this is not the optimal way of choosing a spanning tree. You know from perhaps algorithm course or graph theory that there are better algorithms, but this one has some properties that, well, first, that's the one that's implemented in, uh, 
uh, in the systems, but it's fully distributed and it is able to react to any change in the topology. If you had a central controller that can impose the topology to the, to the bridges, you would not use this algorithm. But of course, we don't have a central controller in most cases, because in order to talk to the bridges, we need the bridges to be able to communicate. So we have one of the root problems we have in networking, which is that we are building an algorithm whose goal is to establish connectivity. So we cannot use an out-of-band mechanism in most cases. Sometimes there are cases where you can have an out-of-band channel to talk to the bridges, but in most cases it's not true. So each bridge has a bridge label, uh, and the one with the most beautiful label or the smallest value is elected, and then the lands uh, com compute the cost from themselves to the, to the root or from the root to themselves. The costs are symmetric and the costs are by definition made as the sum of the cost of all the LANs, the local area network technologies, which are Ethernet or Wi-Fi, that interconnect the, uh, the bridges and it's a d typically a decreasing function of the bit rate. If you have a link between two bridges at one gigabit per second, you give it a small cost compared to a link at 10 megabit per second, to which you will give a high cost, because you want as much as possible the tree to choose the high speed uh, lines. Right? So all bridges compute two things. One, who is the root? That's very easy. You can simply flood to everybody who you are, and everybody repeats that to everyone. And then uh, sooner or later, you will detect who has the best ID, who is the smaller ID. Then once you know who is the smaller ID, you can do a protocol which is practically the same as what we will see in the distance vector module, which is a distributed protocol to compute shortest path from self to this route. Now the beauty of this algorithm is that those, what I describe as two phases, is in fact a single phase. So you do the two at the same time. The, we will not see in detail how it works because we will see in detail how a distance vector works and this is very similar. Uh, but in order to understand how, uh, what it produces, so what it does is we need to understand the concept of ports that it gives. So the spanning tree, when it has converged, when the algorithm has run and the network is stable, it ends up in having giving given roles or labels to ports. Ports in this bridge algorithm means interfaces. A bridge has, a, when it has computed the shortest path to the, to the root, then the interface that leads to this shortest path is called the root, is called root port. If there are multiple equal paths, equal cost paths, you have to pick one of them. So you have only one single a path here. That's different from what we'll see in routing protocols where we will allow multiple equal cost paths. Here we don't. Then a bridge uh, has other ports and ports that are on every link between multiple bridges. On Ethernet today typically a link uh, connects only two bridges. So when two bridges are connected they have to decide who of the two is better, is closer to the route. The one that's closer to the root is called the designated bridge on this link. And the corresponding interface of this bridge is called a designated interface. So using this procedure, the interfaces are either root or designated. And all the other interfaces that are not root or not designated are blocking. That means they are blocked for traffic. They are, outs they are the ones that make the breaks on the spanning tree. For example, here is a small uh, topology of six bridges. You have point-to-point -point links with their costs, and here you have a shared medium link. It may be an old-style Ethernet, or it may be power line connectivity, if you have power line in your house, or it, might buy a, it may be a Wi-Fi thing. So we can think of all the links as one collision domain, and the bridges separate the collision domains here. Assume we run the spanning tree protocol between those six bridges, and assume the labels are exactly what is written. So in effect, the best label will be B1, so B1 is the root. Now if I zoom on bridge three, what is the state of its three ports, three interfaces, one, two, three? That's what you're asked to find out now. I close the poll in five seconds.
So let's see the, the answer. So you should see the results where the correct answer is in fact B. Bad luck today with my questions. Uh, here is why. Okay, so this is um, Oops. This is the, the root. So in red, I'm showing the shortest path tree that all bridges compute. They compute the shortest distance from themselves to the root. All costs are 100 except this one. So that's a shortcut. So B3 should go directly here. B2 should go directly here because all other paths are longer. And from B4, B6, you have a cost of 100 plus one. So this is the shortest path tree. So as a first approximation, we can say this is uh, what happens. Those links are disconnected. But there is a subtle thing which, say, which says that, in fact, those links are themselves, they are links between bridges, but they are local area networks. In simple cases, they are point-to-point -point links, and then you don't care just whether what happens here, the link is not used. But in other cases, this link might be a shared medium Ethernet. There might be hosts connected here. For example, if this is a Wi-Fi network, there might be a host A that is on this uh, shared medium Ethernet. Like here, there are three bridges on the same shared medium Ethernet. So if there is a host here, we need still to open one of the two ports. Right? We need to say whether we reach the spanning tree from here or from here. So we, this is why we have this concept of designated ports versus blocking here. So if we analyze here uh, what will happen, if I am at bridge B3, I have to compute what is the root port. That's the port that goes to the root. Question? Everything is the same subnetwork from the IP viewpoint, correct. Yes, this is why I use the word collision domain. A LAN from the viewpoint of IP is something where you can transmit packets using only the MAC layer. All of this for IP is one LAN. Now, from the viewpoint of the bridging protocol, you have LANs and sub-LANs, if you want, that are typically called LANs here, but the entire thing is also called a, a LAN. Uh, so think of this as one collision domain and the entire bridge as a bridged LAN, or very often called a LAN only. Right. So if we come back to bridge B3, this is clearly the root port. Now we should know whether this port is open or closed. So we have to now zoom on this LAN, on this uh, collision domain, or this link between the two. And the question is, which of the two bridges is closer to the root? Now, because there's a distance 1 here, it is B3. So B3 is closer to the root than B2. So we should open this port and close this one. Which means that if there would be a system that is connected not on the port of the bridge, but directly connected to the link here, for example, because it's a wireless link, then the traffic of this one will go through the port 2 of B3 and not the port here of B2. Now, if A, which is here truly on the shared me on the collision domain between B4 and B5, sends a packet to B, so B is connected to a port of the switch, the packet from A to B will follow, of course, it will be on this LAN, this port is blocked. Blocked here means B4 does not do the learning method on this port. For B4, it is as if this port did not exist, except for one thing. Which thing? Well, B4 continues to run the spanning tree protocol on this port. So the bridges continue to talk to each other to verify whether there is still somebody at the end. So the spanning tree protocol periodically sends spanning tree protocol packets that will be visible if we do a Wireshark uh, that's able to see the spanning tree protocol packets on, uh, on this link, but all data traffic, user traffic, will, will be blocked. In particular, B, B4 does not listen to MAC addresses on this port, but B5 does. So because B5 does, when A sends a packet, B5 has learned that A is on this port. So B5 will copy the packet that has destination address B and will send it along the spanning tree to B. 
if A, if B5 does not know where B is, it will flood it, which means it will be sent along all the spanning tree, including on this port here, and so it will also reach B. Voilà, this is how the spanning tree protocol works. We'll do a break and resume in 10 minutes. So we're ready to resume. A side effect of the spanning tree protocol, which again, is the spanning tree protocol is the standard thing that learning bridges do. And standard bridges are learning bridges. I mean, a good thing is that it's completely plug and play. So if you buy five bridges, you connect them together, uh, they will find a way to distribute the topology to compute a spanning tree. And since a spanning tree is built, the learning process will work. There will be no loop. And if one of the link is broken, then they will readapt, and therefore uh, it's completely plug and play. Now, there are still some downsides. Uh, for example, if I have a, a loop, which is a frequent topology, what will the spanning tree do? Well, typically, it will break one of the ports. It will not break, but it will disable one of the ports for forwarding traffic. Which one, we don't really know. It depends who is selected as the route, and if uh, a, a ring is completely symmetric, so it doesn't really matter. But, if, for example, if this is the route, and if the shortest path chosen from this one is here, there are two equal cost shortest path, you will pick one of the two based on, the, for example, the smallest, the interface that has the smallest number. If it picks this one, that means this port uh, will be uh, broken. In particular, if there, is, whoops, if there is traffic from A to B, it will follow the long way instead of going through the shortest path here. So this is not efficient from a traffic viewpoint, but this is how it is. If you care about efficiency, you have to implement other forms of bridging that are called shortest path bridging, but they are not plug and play. Shortest path bridging is like a routing protocol. Uh, you need to configure a number of things in your bridges, which is done in, I would say, some enterprise bridges, in particular uh, industrial network bridges that want to compute intelligent paths, but by default, uh, it's not very frequently, uh, it's not done, and it's also not very frequently done today. We will skip this. So that is what we will see about bridges. So the Mac layer with bridges, we've done pretty much a lot of it. A few more details. Here is what you have seen in your packet traces about Ethernet. In fact, so this is an Ethernet packet. Uh, at least according to the Ethernet v2 packet format. There are two packet formats, one called Ethernet, another one called 802.1. Uh, they are a bit different, and most systems use Ethernet, but not all. Uh, but your pretty printer of Wireshark is able to print correctly according to the format. The, the all packets start with something that is not visible in a, in a packet capture. Uh, is called a preamble. When you receive a packet on an interface, the, you have to see when you sample the bits that are transmitted by the physical layer, and when does a frame start. There are multiple ways to do it. Essentially, you have synchronous physical layers and asynchronous physical layers. Synchronous physical layer always transmit a bit, and if there is nothing to transmit, you transmit a known pattern of zeros, for example so that the two ends of a transmission link are always physically synchronized. Ethernet is not synchronized. Ethernet is asynchronous in the sense that if there is nothing to transmit on a link, then you physically transmit nothing, which goes together with the original idea of the uh, CSMA-CD protocol. And when you have something to transmit, then you need to detect that the transmission starts, which takes some time. Therefore, there are eight bytes that are not part of the data, that are just bytes that are present for waking up the receiving hardware and do a number of things, like synchronize also the clocks to know exactly when are the transitions. And, and uh, uh, this preamble starts with a well-known pattern uh, that dictates the end of the, of the preamble. So that, of course, out of the 10 or 100 megabits per second, we lose uh, some, some amount of data. Then the data, what is inside an Ethernet frame we've seen already, contains essentially destination address, source address. That's the MAC header. 
a type, which is sometimes called ether type, which uh, explains what is inside the packets. For example, most of the time, an IP v4 or v6 packets. Here you see that an IPv6 packet is not an IP packet of version 6. It's treated as a different type of packets. Right? It's IP versions 1, 2, 3, 4 were always the same type of packets. Then after version 5, that did not really exist. I, version 6 is treated differently. So that we find again this philosophy that IPv6 is not the next version of IP. It's treated as a different protocol. Most of the time, that's all we see. We've seen also that ARP, our protocol used for IP v4 are not IP packets, so they have a special Ethernet type, but that's old style. We've seen that the ARP, the equivalent of ARP for IPv6, which is called NDP, uh, uses the IP protocol, so it is inside an IPv6 protocol. Then there is a zoo of a very large number of other protocols. Most of them are not used today. There are things like to mention the glorious ones, there is Apple Talk. So at the origin, an Apple Talk packet was inside an Ethernet frame with a special uh, type, which is called, uh, which was for Apple. Um, what survives today are things like MPLS. So we'll talk a bit about MPLS if time permits at the end. MPLS is something a bit weird that is used uh, to do what is called connection-oriented network. It doesn't use IP at all. It's used in the backbone of uh, in. ISPs of uh, internet carriers. And then you have special things in the industrial world. You have lots of protocols that are pre-IP, if you want, or that are non-IP, like the precision time protocol that is sending packets for synchronizing clocks with very high accuracy. And if you want to do this, you need special bridges that recognize those packets because it's not acceptable that those packets are queued because if they are queued, they will have a random delay. So those switches want to give deterministic delays to such packets or as close to deterministic as possible. So they recognize those packets directly already at this level. Uh, that's an example of non-IP protocols. The, then comes, of course, the, the payload, which is typically an IPv4 packet. There are other formats that are called I, IEEE that contain an, uh, an accumulation of headers that are uh, a bit different, but essentially they provide the same thing. And at the end, in all cases, there is a 4-byte, 32-bit uh, CRC, cyclic redundancy checksum, which is a very simple error detection code that uh, is if there is a random error on the, it's like a hash of the packet, but which has been designed particularly for error detection. So it's able to detect uh, up to uh, three bit errors and all error bursts of length less than 32 means, triple error means if there are three, if you change three bits in the ethernet frame anywhere, then the, frame check sequence will be wrong. You will compute uh, this verification checksum and it will be wrong, so you will detect it. And it has a bit more uh, peculiarities that are given here. So the effect of that is that the probability that a packet that is transmitted over Ethernet is wrong, is incorrectly transmitted, is extremely small. So with Ethernet, like with any uh, computer network protocol, we don't want to have bit errors. So we try to transmit packets that have no bit error. If there is a bit error, which means if the physical layer didn't do its job well, was not able to uh, correct the, uh, the error, the packet is dropped. We prefer to drop than to deliver a packet that has some errors. That's typical of the digital world. In the analog world, if we would do, for example, PCM, uh, pulse code modulated voice. So essentially, you, if, you co if you record an audio signal and you encode every uh, sample uh, of the signal independent of each other, which would be the very primitive form of encoding, then if one packet is wrong, you don't care after all, because the, the audio signal will be a bit distorted. Uh, but it's better to deliver it with a small distortion than to deliver nothing and to create a gap. But modern audio coding signals don't do that. They compress very aggressively. And the compression has the effect that if you lose a packet, then it's 
a packet that contains important synchronization information, then you will, uh, or sorry, if this packet is wrong, then the entire signal uh, will be corrupted. So you don't want this. Not to speak of when you copy a file from a place to another, you don't want to introduce errors in the copying. We've talked about the addressing. Again, we find this mental model. That is the mental model of the Mac layer where a system sends a packet by putting a destination address, and it thinks of the Mac layer as a shared medium thing, even though today it's probably, at least in the case of wired system, it's based on switches, but the effect is the same. Uh, we say that this form of bridging is called transparent bridging in the sense that there is no way for a device to know whether it is in this or that situation. Whether you are on shared medium Ethernet, which would be exotic today, or whether you are on a bridged Ethernet, uh, everything is exactly the same from the viewpoint of the end system, which means this mental model continues to work. Now, there is still a difference, in a practical difference, in particular for security, in a shared medium thing, every system sees the, the packet. So you can have a packet sniffer pretty much anywhere on the link. Whereas on a bridge, if you put a packet sniffer, it has, you have to break the wire and do a repeater. Uh, otherwise, if you're anywhere else on the bridge, you will not see the data practically never. There might be a few cases where you see some data. When could that happen? Yes? At the beginning, when a bridge doesn't know, at the beginning or after, when the bridge has lost the association between a MAC address and the port, which typically occurs at the beginning, it will broadcast to all ports. So if you are here just when the broadcast occurs, then you will see uh, all traffic. But that is very rare. Uh, we've seen that one special address is the broadcast address, which IPv6 doesn't like, but is used heavily by IPv4 and other protocols. Uh, how is broadcast used when there are bridges? Well, it's very simple. Since the bridges have built a spanning tree, they can use it for flooding the broadcasts. That's one of the virtues of the, uh, of the bridges, of the, of the spanning tree. So if a packet is sent anywhere by this host, for example, it will be flooded uh, following the spanning tree here. So it will be sent on all the lands through all the designated or root ports and not uh, across the blocked ports. And since this is a tree, there's no loop, so there, will, there is no risk of looping packets. By the way, one thing uh, we see in the Ethernet format, there is something missing compared to IP. Yes? There is no? There is no time to leave, no TTL, no hop limit. So if a packet loops, then you're really stuck with uh, uh, with Ethernet, so at least with the standard Ethernet. So if and this is consistent with the fact that we build a spanning tree. It means also that when we build and modify the spanning tree, we must be very cautious not to open a port when it has changed its state from blocking to non-blocking. It's important to be sure that by doing this, we don't introduce loops. So the spanning tree protocol does that. It has considerably long timers Whenever there is a change of state of a port, it waits many, many seconds before opening it. At the expense of loss of availability, when there is a change, there are periods of time where we lose some connectivity, but we must absolutely avoid loops in, uh, in, in bridge network. Now, the broadcast is used by IPv4. IPv6, as we have seen, doesn't like it, so it will use uh, multicast addresses. There are other systems that use multicast. We will talk about IP multicast. This is used, for example, for IP telephony distribution. iTunes uses it if you stream audio uh, at home on your, uh, on your network. It will use uh, multicast addresses. Multicast addresses have, the G, the, have a special bit equal to one. We've seen the seventh bit, which is the local or universal bit. The eighth bit is the group uh, bit, and uh, which means that they they have, when we write them in exa, the last digit is odd. So those are all multicast addresses. 
And practically, there are two types of addresses that are frequently seen. The one that I use for IPv4 multicast that have this prefix. So there are 24 bits that are useful for differentiating different types, different addresses, different channels. And IPv6 uses 32 bits. And then you have different things like uh, you have for any industrial protocol is using its own uh, type of uh, multicast addresses. That's the one used, for example, for the precision time protocol. The mental model originally of the uh, of the broad of the any of the multicast address is not very different from broadcast. In fact, the, what it means is because on a shared medium everything is natively broadcast. Multicast simply means that. If B subscribes to this address, the adapter at B will copy it, and at C it will also copy it, which is not very different from uh, broadcast. So if that's how multicast is done, you might wonder why does IPv6 insist... Uh, oops, let me... Let me... Uh, unlike multicast address... No, that's all. We, we, we might wonder how, I, why... Um, why uh, we, do any, we, we do multicast. We, we'll talk about it when we talk about IP multicast. Bridges don't have a protocol to run IP multicast. So normally, that's the only, thing, the only thing that the bridge can do is broadcast the multicast traffic, to repeat this. In sophisticated bridges uh, do something that violates the layers. They say, because at the IP layer, there is a mechanism to know what to do with multicast traffic. So bridges can copy what happens there. They can see whether somebody at some part of the network is listening, and then they can build a distribution tree, which is very much what an IP multicast routing protocol does. So we'll talk more about that when we talk about uh, IP multicast. I'll skip that and continue here. Other questions so far? The last topic about this uh, Mac layer story is uh, the virtual LANs, not the mast, but the last main topic. So very frequently, when we see Ethernet networks, practically invariably, uh, in enterprise settings, people use virtual LANs. So this is something very weird that is really a legacy of the mental model of the Internet being made of LANs interconnected by routers. Now, if you do really this, if you interconnect LANs with routers, uh, and if you care, to, if, if, if it means something to be in the same LAN, then you have a problem. So sometimes it means something to be in the same LAN. Some applications, for example, may work only in a LAN. iTunes, for example, if you stream iTunes audio at home, it will work only in a LAN. It doesn't send multicast beyond a router. So if you are smart and you've built a complicated network at home with routers and you stream iTunes, it won't work. Right. Except if you, and if you want this to work, you have to build what is called virtual LANs. So virtual LANs consists in having a large network of switches, like we have at TPFL, for example. By default, if you have a large network of switches, you have routers also in between. And if you're separated by a router, you're in the same LAN. If you're not separated by routers, you're, sorry, you're not in the same LAN. If you are uh, separated by router, you're not in the same LAN. If you're not separated by routers, you're in the same LAN. But, and this is typically done old style by having all people in the same floor at EPFL was one local area network. So if you happen to have an office at the floor two of BC, you are in the subnet 156, for example. This is how things were traditionally. But now uh, you may want, for example, to stream iTunes inside your lab. And if you want to do that, you would like that all the people in your lab receive that streaming, but not people who happen to be at the same floor. So you want a logical assignment of LANs that does not depend on where you're sitting. Where you're sitting has to do with the cabling and where the switches in the cabinets are put at the ends of, of the wall. A virtual LAN is, uh, allows to decouple uh, the LAN that you belong to from the physical cabling. So you assume you have a large, a huge interconnection of switches. And in this case here, the blue, green, and red would like to be 
to belong to two different lands. So we see a case where we have two lands that are on the same switch and we would like them to be separated. I mentioned the iTunes streaming. It might be you have two labs on the same floor and those guys don't want to receive the broadcasts of the other. It might be also that you are in the in a shared office building, you have two companies that use the same building network infrastructure, but you don't want that the two networks uh, communicate at the MAC layer, for example, perhaps because of uh, traffic isolation. So that's the first case. The second case is the opposite. You might have different, uh, no, it's very similar, but how the, uh, the different uh, hosts can be on different switches. So how does it work? Uh, it's very simple. Uh, you need intelligent switches that are not just the bridges you buy at Migro and you connect that implement learning and the spanning tree protocol. You need a switch that has a management interface. So you can talk to the switch by connecting to it through a management application. So those switches, because they have a management interface, you can configure on each of them. So you know this is the switch of BC floor two. And I know that the plugs, the sockets that corresponds to the two rooms here must be on the green LAN. And the two sockets that correspond to people that are in another office, they must be on the red LAN. So I configure that in the switch. And if the switch supports virtual LANs, what it does is it treats those collection of ports, the green and the red, as completely separate things. So it will, they were physically, they're not physically separated, they will cross the switching fabric of the switch. But from the spanning tree protocol, for example, from the learning viewpoint, they will be separated. So if A sends a packet to F, then they will be learning. Similarly, if B sends a packet to X, there will be a spanning tree protocol that runs between the two blue instances of the bridges here. But they will not be between red and green or not between green and blue. For example, if A sends a packet with MAC address D, the it will be impossible. It will be made impossible because it is as if in the switch, in the virtual LAN switch, there were two bridges, a red one and a green one. So the green one learns the addresses that come on the green ports and the red one on the red ports and they don't share their information. So they are as if they would be physically separated. So that solves uh, the problem, as long as the traffic remains on one switch, now you have a small issue. If B is blue here and goes to this switch, and if this switch has blue, but assume it has also some other, some green traffic, some green port here, how does it know that the traffic that is coming here is a blue or a green packet? Because this link between two switches, which is sometimes called a trunk, does not belong to a specific virtual LAN. You might have multiple LAN traffic that is multiplexed on this LAN. So this is solved by adding a label in the, um, inserting a label in the Ethernet packet. So we saw that the Ethernet packet is in principle destination address, source address, ether type. Well, we can insert here uh, before the type a four byte header, which has this number, that means that's virtual LAN, and then uh, two bytes identify the number of the virtual LAN. So there will be a number for blue here. So that all the packets that are carried between the switches, we will know to which virtual LAN they belong. We could also do that on the, whoops. Uh, you could do that also here between the switch and, uh, and, uh, and, and A, but if this is a point-to-point -point link, you don't need to do that because the switch knows that all traffic that is here belongs to the green LAN. It's only on the trunks between switches that you don't know, for example, if you receive a packet here, whether it's green or red, and you use that simple tagging scheme. If you observe that a bit carefully, you should have a problem. The way I present it, it doesn't work. I said a minute ago that the normal Ethernet frame does not have a VLAN tag. But if you want to insert, to have a VLAN tag, you insert it. But now the question is, how do you know which format of the packet you have? How do you know whether you have an Ethernet packet with a VLAN tag or an Ethernet packet without VLAN tag? Normally, how do we know 
what is inside a packet? Well, first we need to have the layer below that tells us what kind of packet it is. Now, the layer below, there is none. There's a physical layer that doesn't say anything. So all we know is an Ethernet packet. So we would need, if we have, for example, if we have an option in an IP header, we have somewhere at the end of the IP header something that says whether there is an option field. Or we have, for example, what is the length of the IP header. So we have a mechanism to indicate whether there is an option or not. Here we don't have this. So what's the magic? How can it work? Well, more precisely, how can a node that thinks there is no VLAN tag, it will interpret the first two bytes here as an ether type. Right? So it will interpret this as an ether type and will decide, uh, well, that's the, that's the solution. Uh, those two bytes here are in fact a byte that are not possible for any other protocol, or if you want, that's the ether type that corresponds to the presence of a VLAN tag here. Let's conclude this uh, section by this question here. I have, I'm zooming on the left of the previous figure. A has an IP packet destined to C. Right? They're not on the same VLAN, but they may talk together for whatever reason. Uh, what should A do in terms of ARP? The correct answer is C, none of the above. Right? It's tempting to, see, to say B, that was the original majority. Uh, but two VLANs are two different LANs, so two subnetworks. So if a talks to C, if, there is, if that's the only thing you have, it won't work. You need a router. From one VLAN to another VLAN, you need a router. Yes? But does A know that it is a different virtual LAN than C? Of course. Yes, and how? Well, it doesn't know if it's on a different virtual LAN. The virtual LAN is typically not visible to you and me. But it will know something. It will know, if things are correctly configured, it will know that the subnetwork prefix of A is not the same as C. So you're sending to a, so if the, if the subnet prefix is the same, that's a configuration mistake. You're talking to someone else that has a wrong IP address, then it won't work. You will not be able to reach it. You will do an ARP to get C's MAC address. Nobody will respond to your ARP. Because if you do ARP, you will, with IPv4, you will broadcast in the green VLAN. Nobody in the green VLAN has the IP address. C will not respond because it's not in the green VLAN. So you're trying to reach someone you think is in your subnetwork and is not. It won't work. Right. A will? will A will not, should not send an ARP to C if A has. What, if A has a packet to send to C, what should A do? It should have a next hop router. It should send it to a router. So hopefully on this green VLAN, there is a router somewhere. If there is not, you're stuck. It won't work. Yes? Yes, it is transparent. The VLAN in itself does not affect the prefix, but if your IP layer is correctly configured, you should have an IP prefix that is compatible with the fact that you are on the same VLAN as all the other guys who have the same prefix. If you're not, there is a configuration error. So of course, when you configure the VLAN switches and you configure your DHCP server, I mean, hopefully you have a tool to configure the two at the same time. Otherwise, you have to make sure the configuration is correct. But there's the same problem that you have if you don't have VLANs. If you have a large network with 200 physical switches, you have to make sure that the things that are on the same LAN have the same prefix, that the same problem exists. So this will not work. Now, practically, what you will need is something like this. You will need that there is a router somewhere that is both on the gray, on the green, and the red VLAN. Right? 
and you will need to send to the MAC address of the router and of this. Right. In practice, what is very often done is that this box that is called a switch and this box that is called a router, they are the same box. They're called a layer two slash three switch. So that the function of routing will be done on the same box here, uh, but logically, you must enable it as a router here. Question? Can you, can you speak louder? No, no. If we just have a switch here, and it implements only layer two switching, by definition of a virtual LAN, two net two systems that are not in the same virtual LAN cannot communicate, at least not at the MAC layer. They must find a way to communicate through an upper layer, which normally is through an IP router. Question? When? Here, there's no need for a VLAN tag because all the things are on the same switch. So there's no need for a VLAN tag. So the question is, when do we need a VLAN tag? You need a VLAN tag when you have the same VLAN that spans multiple switches. For example, perhaps to make it even clearer, assume that you have also a red host here, X that is on this third switch here. So this is a red, it belongs to the red VLAN, but it's here. That's typically why VLANs have been, have been invented. It's able to support that kind of things. You have somebody who is not at all in this location, anywhere on the campus, and you want it to have the impression it is as if it would be in the same building. So this switch knows this guy is on the red VLAN, so it will treat them as blue and red are separated, but it needs to build, for example, a spanning tree with a red spanning tree with this switch here. So it will build a red spanning tree by using spanning tree protocol packets that have the VLAN tag that says it's red. Also, when this guy X sends a packet to C, for example, on those lines between the switches, it will be tagged with the VLAN ID that says it is red. So that when this guy receives it, uh, if, if it does bridging, it will bridging on the red spanning tree, and here also it will know this is a packet that can be delivered only to the red uh, VLAN here. So there is everything we saw for, for learning and for the spanning tree. There is one copy of all those things per VLAN. So the switches here have one f red forwarding table, one green forwarding table, and one blue if there are red, green, or blue devices. And there are three spanning trees in this example here. Now, the spanning trees are not very complicated. It's a small uh, network. But in a larger network, there will be as many spanning trees as there are VLANs here. And the broadcasts stay uh, inside the VLANs. So that's a very typical example of what we want to do to have economies that we are here we are putting several logical network on the same physical infrastructure of course my we, we might criticize this by saying that uh, it's not very smart to do vlans because after all we're starting to do things with the local area network that's supposed to be just an access mechanism we start to treat it as if it would be a true networking layer and some people do this criticism if you had better security mechanisms, perhaps you would not need that at all. Or some, some people even say, relying on VLANs to separate traffic is very weak and not very uh, efficient. But it's very heavily done. It's uh, uh, quite popular in all enterprise networks. Um, we have not seen uh, this animal here, the repeater. Let me just mention its existence. So we can view the bridges as this thing here. In the, if you remember the animations we've done with the router in the, in the middle, a bridge is something that interconnects two physical layers and forwards packets based on the uh, MAC addresses, essentially. There exist also intermediate systems that are called repeaters of the physical layer 
Um, they exist, for example, if you want to interconnect a fiber system to a copper system, so you want to change physically the medium, then you have something that reads all the bits here, re-encodes them and sends them here on the other end. So that's also another example. Old Ethernet hubs in the past were repeaters, uh, but today uh, this is practically visible only in the cases I mentioned to change the physical nature of a, of a cable. Now, very often you can bridge, as I mentioned several times, between different Mac layer technologies. That's one of the virtues of bridging. For example, you can put a bridge between Wi-Fi and Ethernet here. Very often the bridge is in what is called the Wi-Fi base station, but as Ethernet plugs uh, many Ethernet ports here, very often the bridge is integrated here. If it's not integrated, you can have a bridge that has a Wi-Fi uh, antenna and uh, connected to here. Bridging is very often used to interconnect um, Wi-Fi antennas to make a large network. So this is typically what is done at EPFL, where you have the different Wi-Fi antennas that have limited coverage. Even in a house, you may, have, you may need to have one per floor. So how do you interconnect the different uh, Wi-Fi antennas? Well, a Wi-Fi antenna is nothing else than a local area uh, switching system. So you can interconnect with routers or with uh, bridges. Very often, you interconnect them with bridges which means that the Wi-Fi antennas are connected to an Ethernet and, uh, and multiple Wi-Fi antennas can be connected uh, to, to the Ethernet. If you do this, the Wi-Fi packet format is a bit different, or oh, this is in order to support this, that the Wi-Fi packet format is a bit different than the Ethernet packet format. Essentially, the main difference is that in Wi-Fi packets, you have up to four MAC addresses. You might wonder why four. Well, that's uh, completely crazy. On an, on an Ethernet packet, you have the source address, which you need for knowing where the packet comes from, for learning, for all that stuff, and the destination, which, of course, you need to know where the packet is going. When you do Wi-Fi, you have an intermediate thing, which is the base station address. So if A is sending a packet to G, for example. So I'm assuming here I have two Wi-Fi antennas that are bridged. And, our, and on the bridge network, there is also a host, G, which is connected via uh, Ethernet directly. It's a very frequent setting because the uh, virtue of bridging is you don't need to configure the subnet mask, all that stuff. So you put everything in the same subnet mask. If this is you at home, you don't want to bother managing subnets and DHCP and that stuff. So that's a very uh, common way to, uh, to do it. Now, if A sends a packet to G, then they're in the same LAN from the IP viewpoint. They're in the same subnetwork, even though they are not in the same collision domain. There is uh, Wi-Fi here, and there is all of this is one big bridge network. So the des what A should do is find the MAC address of G and send a packet that has destination address G here. So source address A, destination MAC address G. However, the way the Wi-Fi access protocol, the Wi-Fi MAC works, it needs a destination address to be able to uh, manage the collisions and uh, in particular the base station needs to know that A is sending a packet that has to be received by the base station here. That's different from an Ethernet bridge. An Ethernet bridge you don't send to the MAC address of the bridge you send to the final MAC address and the bridge copies because the bridge copies everything. But in Wi-Fi, you don't do that. That would not be efficient on wireless networks. So you have to explicitly say this packet is destined to E. Right? So you need to give both. It's like a source routing address, if you want. You have to give the final destination at the MAC layer and the intermediate MAC layer destination. This is why in Wi-Fi, you have a third address, which is called, for example, the access point address. In very complicated cases that you find sometimes, I was once in vacation in Portugal in a very nice place, and they had several houses with exactly this, this configuration. They had multiple Wi-Fi base stations that are interconnected. The normal way is to interconnect them with an Ethernet cable. But if you don't know how to do it, you can also interconnect them with 
Wi-Fi. So A, M1 is connected to M2 because M2 is within range of M1. M3 is connected to M2 because it's within range. So that's the philosophy of mesh network. Uh, that works well when you want to do a mesh network for controlling your home thermostat because you send one packet every minute. Uh, but it works much less well uh, when if you want to stream video on this uh, infrastructure. But it's a way that works. I mean, physically, connectivity exists. Why do I say that it doesn't work very well? Yes? Because there is only one channel, unless the external channels. So, if you have a single channel, you don't need many more versions that you work on the platform. Exactly. By default, here, I mean, M2 has to be on the same channel as M1 because it wants to communicate with M1, which also has to be on the same channel as M3. So they have to be on the same channel, the three, except if M2 is able to have multiple channels at the same time, which would be an optimization that would make this work better. But if you don't, that means that whenever A sends a packet, the packet at M1 causes a collision everywhere. So M2 cannot do anything while it is sending, M1 is receiving the packet. But worse, when A sends a packet to M1, that causes all the rest to remain silent, this packet will be retransmitted from M1 to M2, which again causes everybody to be silent, and etc. So a single packet creates a chain of possible collision several times, so that the total throughput is divided by uh, many, many times here. Nonetheless, if you do this, it works technically. And uh, if you don't have many, many hops, that may be a cheap way to interconnect. Now you have, again, uh, the same kind of problems that you had before. Then if those two, if we look at what happens at the packet sent by two, so assume A sends a packet to B, so it will create a Wi-Fi packet, source address A, destination address B, but this packet will be sent with uh, base station address M1, so access point M1. But now when the packet is retransmitted here between M2 and M3, Uh, you have to run the Wi-Fi protocol between M2 and M3. And if you remember, the Wi-Fi protocol does things like acknowledgement. So it needs to know whom to send the acknowledgement to. M3 will not send the acknowledgement to A because it is the packet sent by M2 to M3 and M2 needs to know there is no collision and the transmission went okay. So you need to know the address of M2 and also the address of M3. So you have the transmit point, the transmit access point address and the receive access point address, so that in total you can have up to four MAC addresses in a Wi-Fi packet. So if you do a Wireshark with Wi-Fi, you will see up to four addresses. Apart from that, uh, Wi-Fi is very much the same as Ethernet. Voila, we'll stop here for today. So see you again tomorrow.